win, you know, because they are not stuck together. They cannot fly in the corridor. You have the major subjects of the whole book, Vedanta Sutra, and it's based basically on the, the three analyses that Jeep Goswami is giving of Sambandha, Vidya, Prayojana. Sambandha means to know Brahman, Brahman with the universe, to know Jiva, and Jiva is relation with the universe and is a relationship with Brahman. This is called Sambandha. Uh, before you establish a relationship, you have to know the other person, you have to know yourself also. Then Sadhana, of course, is Abhideya, and Paramapurusharta, or Prayojana, it's called Pala, in, in the fruit, what it gives you. The second page is the, um, of the uh, important sutra. So we uh, covered uh, not even half of them, four, four of them. Atato Brahma Jikyasana. So I put the translation here. I don't know if you can read it. And in bracket, what is not uh, given? Because you have to supply many words in order to understand. So literally, now, therefore, the desire to inquire about Brahma. Then B for Brahma. In bracket, B for Brahma is how, who, what is this Brahma? from whom everything manifests and also this Adi means and the rest meaning is maintained, is destroyed then the question in, in the bracket you have to supply in order to understand the link between all these different proposals so how do we know that this is the definition of Brahman this is the pertinent question and Srila Badarayan <coughs> Vyasadevi the answer because Shastra, you can put it in singular or plural if you want. Shastra means the embodiment of all scriptures, or Shastra with an S, including many scriptures. According to Madhvacharya, it includes Veda, Mahabharata, Purana, uh, Itihasa, uh, Tantras, different, all the scriptures. So, because Shastra is the source, the yoni. This is how we know, because the other source of knowledge, of valid knowledge, called Pramana, like Pratyaksha or Anumana, they uh, are imperfect. But Shabda, Shabda Brahma, we call it Shabda Brahma, actually, uh, Brahman can also designate the Veda. This uh, Shastra gives evidence, full evidence. So, and the fourth into bracket, in order to understand how do we read and understand Shastra, there's a method that is given by Shiva Marvacharya and also by Baladev Vidyabhushana through a thorough examination and logical connection, Samanvaya. This is the best I could do to translate this. If you turn the page, I gave you this example yesterday. You have this uh, example from Briyat Samhita. Marvacharya says the exegetical tool. Some people were asking, what does this word mean? It means to study a holy scripture and try to extract the essence with uh, some methodology. So he gives six way of an uh, uh, easy way. If you want to understand a book or a passage or a verse, you have to study how it begins, what is the opening sentence, what is the closing sentence, what is the repetition in the, sen in the, in the verse or in the passage or in the book, what is the thing that is new, what the fruit, what does it give you to read this, what is, uh, is glorified, over glorified, the Artavada, and what is the logical links between all this and, and this an example is given by Balade Vidya Bhushana. don't mind the diacritics you know it's, it's a different thing um, this famous verse of two birds sitting in the tree one eats the fruit the other one is looking so I underline I put into uh, dark Dvasuparna then in the last verse Anyam Isham you have two birds, but another one is Isha. 
this is be beginning and end. So you already have an ID on two verses that you have two birds, but one actually is called the Lord. Then what is the repetition? It's underlined, anyam. And the third line, anyam pipalam, anashananam anyo. Then in the second verse also, jushtam yada pashati anyam. And what is the fruit that it gives you? Vita shokka, meaning that all lamentation will go away. And what is the novelty? The novelty is to teach actually, many Upanishads teach the oneness between Brahman and Atman, but this is teaching a duality. By the way, this verse and many other verses in Upanishad appears already in the Rig Veda. In the first book of the Rig Veda, and it reappears in this <coughs> two Upanishad actually, and it's also given in the eleventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam with the different uh, um, Sanskrit words, but the same meaning. Meaning that if a verse is repeated, because if you want to study Bhagavatam, you also study the first verse and the last verse. The first verse. Is glorifying Krishna, Janmadi Yataha, the origin of everything, and the rest, and the, this big long verse end with Satyam Param Dimahi. We meditate on this highest truth, and the end of Bhagavatam ends with the glorification of the holy name. So already you have an idea of what the book is speaking. And if you look up the repetition in the book, what are you going to find? Some verses repeat themselves three times. Like this Tulaina Lavenapi, uh, three times. So it's interesting. And along those interpretation, this specific verse, so many verses are parallel, same meaning, about Sadhu Sangha. Then, if you want to look about the chanting of the holy name or remembering Krishna, Vishnu, Harikatha, this is also the repetition is there. Then you can study what is the uh, novelty. Uh, the novelty, of course, is the prema bhakti. Nowhere in any Purana, in any scriptures, is this prema bhakti being emphasized as much. And the sweet aspect of Krishna in, in, in Vrindavan. <coughs> what does it bring you? Of course it brings you this very rare bhakti. So this is the way to, to, to study, uh, to make it interesting. So now, I know that you didn't have all have this paper I gave as assignment to read. This is the fifth sutra. Brahman with the help of this in investigation, that is the Samanvaya, Tattu Samanvaya. By the way, my Bhacharya is saying that Tattu Samanvaya, is, first of all, is the name of the first chapter of Vedanta Sutra, Samanvaya. But it's also the, the way of reading on, on the fifth. The force is the Samanvaya. Tattu Samanvaya. If you go back to your sutras, you see yeah. Tattu Samanvaya. And Ikshate Nasha Dham. That's five. That's the fifth. And it, but, but according to Manvacharya and Bharadeva Vidyabhushana, there is a logical link between all of them. And it's an interesting thing to see that uh, through this Samanvaya, this investigation, then the translation, because I said that modern exegesis require a translation. So maybe you don't know Sanskrit or, or some other uh, la sacred language, let's say. But if you uh, study the word for word, and if you uh, compare also, you can have an idea of a translation. Uh, and even if the commentators knew Sanskrit, they give translation to this Ikshatirana Shabdam. So it is on these uh, pages there, you have four pages, if you have read them, who, have, who has read? Very good, so I'm going to question you now. <laughs> yes, um, it's a little technical. Yes? <laughs> well, these two translations. The first, if you have this, you can follow with me. It's going to be easier. 
and just listening. And you can take a pen and underline. I wrote this, I underlined it, you know, I still underline and put some questions. But of course the question is going to be a little bit more difficult for you to answer since you haven't read before. The first translation that is of Shankaracharya, Ramanuja Acharya, Nimbaditya, they say that this sutra and the following six sutra, let's say, until Ananda Mahayubhya said, they speak about how Brahman is the creator of this world and not Pradhan of the Sankhya. You know Pradhan? You know what Pradhan means? The unmanifested, the nature. This Prakriti and Purusha and before this manifested it is called Pradhan. It's not like Brahman, it's not the same thing. It's just some you can sit anywhere and it's this sit there. But anyway, in the Sankhya of Ishvara Krishna, it has nothing to do with the Lord Krishna, it's just his name. It is a materialist philosophy. There's two kinds of Sankhya. There's a theistic Sankhya and an atheistic Sankhya. Most people refer to the atheistic Sankhya. The theistic Sankhya is given by whom? Kapila Dev. Kapila Dev. And there's two Kapila according to Baladev Vidya Bhushana. There's also an atheistic Kapila and atheistic. The one that is theistic presentator of Sankhya is in Srimad Bhagavatam. Otherwise, the tradition says that there are two principles. There's no Ishwara. There's two principles. There's Purusha, which is the individual soul. Each of us is a Purusha and Prakriti. So, Sankhya is a dualistic uh, philosophy. It says that there is life and matter, basically. Life is different than matter. Life is what gives matter its livelihood. You know, because of the soul, you can call it the soul, no problem, they call it the Purusha. Then the body becomes alive. And if, when the Purusha leaves the body, then the body is called dead. So, this Purusha originally lives alone. And due to seeing the Prakriti, seeing his reflection in the Pradhan, then it activates the Pradhan and Pradhan becomes Prakriti and it becomes covered over by the material energies, the 25, the 24 Tattva. He's the 25th. But basically there's two. Then you have all the senses and you have the elements and so on and so forth. Then when the soul, Purusha, realized that it has nothing to do with the material nature, when he sees actually that this material nature is totally exterior to him, then he realizes his own spiritual state and he goes back to his original state, which is Kevalya. Kevalya meaning to be alone. That doesn't speak about merging into the big one, because the speciality of Sankhya means that there are millions and trillions of Purusha. They are all individual souls, you can call them monads, you know, the Leibniz was talking about, Leibniz was talking about monads. Individual soul, but they don't speak to each other, they don't connect to each other, and there's no Ishwara, there's no Param Purusha, there's only Purusha, little Purusha, and Prakriti. This is called Sankhya, and this is the Sankhya that Vedanta doesn't agree with. It doesn't agree and says, no, there is not Pradhana, which is the origin of the, of the world, because according to Sankhya and modern science, actually Prabhupada was often comparing the two. Modern science says there is no need of a creator because nature acts on itself. And it's true even today, when there's a catastrophe, when there's uh, in Japan, you know, like a big tsunami, or earthquake anywhere in the world, like in, there was uh, recently in Nepal, or when there is a, a, a volcanic eruption, people forget the scientific explanation. They say, why God is punishing us? Funnily enough, they become godly again when there's a catastrophe. But, but scientists, they have explained all these things. You know, you don't need to have a creator. It's not like Krishna is in the center of the world and is shaking the earth, so there could be earthquake somewhere. You know, this tecto tectonic 
plate. plate that moves around and this is responsible for most of the catastrophe that I've been speaking of. And so therefore, same thing for the creation, the famous or infamous Big Bang, whatever, this conception that galaxies are going away from our universe, you know, it's only based on observation. They have no Shabda Praman, of course, it's only based on observation and deduction. Because they could see some redness to the, around the galaxy, they deduced that this red was inducing some going away. If it was blue, it would become, you know, according to the spectrum of light. I'm not going to go into this, but this is the basis of what they call Big Bang. And so it happens according to the law of physics, because if everything was, you can, you can go back in time by concentrating all those galaxies together, 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 you go back in time to a very single point. And this single point is so concentrated with gravity that it just cannot hold and just ex it explodes. This expression, Big Bang, this is very in a nutshell. But anyway, they say that the law of nature can explain everything, even creation. So we know it don't need a creator. That is the materialist uh, Stephen Hawking. That's the, their idea, or Richard Dawkins, you know, I don't know why they have practically the same name, they're both British and both materialist, but anyway, they, they are saying like this, there's no, one wrote the selfish genes, and the other one, the, uh, uh, a brief history of time, yes. Uh, that, oh, Hawkins and Dawkins. Yeah, Hawkins and Dawkins. Yeah. Hawkins and Dawkins are in the boat. Hawkins from the water, yeah. <laughs> you know, the story. Oh, wait, though, isn't it true, though, that in one way, our conception does align itself with the idea of singularity and Big Bang. In one sense, yes. they have it right a little bit, because we also yes. go from completely subtle and unmanifest yes. to manifest. But they can't explain why. They cannot explain even the singularity according to the law of physics. That's yeah. why the Hawkins is looking for the ultimate equation, whatever. Yeah. But uh, they, they have some kind of intuition. Some care is not wrong. What is wrong with some cats to say there's no need of a param purush, that everything happened by itself? Right. That matter generated itself. Yes. Yeah. Matter generates itself. And this is not what uh, Vedanta is saying. Of course, in some cats, the idea of purusha is that there's a transcendental nature of the purusha, that transmigrate also. They believe all the practical, all philosophical school of India believe in reincarnation, except Sarvaka. Shalvaka Muni doesn't believe in reincarnation because this is the only life you live and then when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. There's no paradise, there's no hell. So you don't have to worry. You're not going to go to hell if you do some, something bad. And you're not going to go to heaven if you do something good. So you shouldn't really over-endeavor and worry. This is Shalvaka. But mostly Jainism, Buddhism, uh, Sankhya, Yoga, they all believe in reincarnation. And but they have a different explanation for what reincarnates. Purusha, Anatma, Mya for the Buddhist, or Jiva for the uh, Jains, and so on and so forth. Anyway, the idea of pra Pradhan is being brought up by uh, various commentators, but Madhvacharya and Baladev Vidyabhushana reject this reading or this translation, because it is a translation. So the second translation, if you can follow with me, is saying, on the count of being seen or described, ikshate means it's an ablative, so it means because or on the count of being seen in the scriptures, it should be in brackets also, Brahman is therefore not inexpressible. So they are actually, I think that the spelling I took was from Baladev Vidyabhushana's Govinda Bhashya. Ikshakter na shabdam, the long A. And I think that in more and most manuscript that you find is without a long A, na shabdam, meaning according to Ramanuja, Charya, Shankaracharya, Nimbaditya, mm. this seeing principle is the Purusha that looks at Prakriti. It says in, in, in different Upanishads how Tadikshata Bahusyam, he sees nature and he desires to become many. Purusha. 
So according to Samkhya, it is the little Purusha, the little us, that we see Prakriti, and Prakriti becomes active for us. But according to the Upanishads, actually this Purusha is the Param Purusha. This is the argument of both Shankaracharya and Ramanujacharya and Nimbaditya. They are saying that actually this is Brahman who is making this nature working, not the little Purusha. So Pradhan has no, it's called Ashabda. It is called non-Vedic. And therefore, because it is non-Vedic, it is not in a category of explaining Brahman. It is not like we've seen in the third and fourth sutra. How do we know this? Because Shastra is a source. How do we really understand Shastra through Samanvaya? This Samkhya Karika, the writings of the Sankhya, is not considered Veda, not considered Shastra. You cannot do Samanvaya with Sankhya, and therefore it is called Ashabda and useless. That is the reading of Shankaracharya and, and Ramanuja Acharya. It doesn't approve with the Upanishad saying that all other Sahikshakta Lokandu Srijayati, he thought or he sees, oh, I will create the world. That is in different Upanishad. And um, because it has no Shastra form authority, then we cannot accept it as Brahman. You, you'll read it again, I hope. Now, Marva Acharya and Baladeva Vidyabhushana are introducing something different. Of course, I'm missing the page. I know it's backward, yes. Uh, he's, yeah, by the way, they all also introduced, I'm going to go back before, I'm sorry. Because it's interesting that they also use the sutra to introduce their own philosophical understanding. And Shankaracharya is using this sutra, uh, saying Pradhan is not the source of the universe, but Brahman is. And he's quoting the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, it's the last uh, paragraph, um, third line. It says, he quotes Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, this, this paper, it's page 23. The self or Atma, actually, um, you see in the Sanskrit it's called Atma, Atma Antaryamin. The Antaryami is never the Purusha, it's a, it's a supreme Purusha. Antaryamin means the inner controller. Atma is the self. The self, the internal controller, sees but can be seen, hears but can be heard, thinks but can be thought of, perceives but can be perceived. There is no other seer but him, no other listener than him, no other thinking but him. So Shankaracharya, he gives then his idea of upadi, superimposition. You have these words in the verse, Sarvo padi vinir muktam tat manam rishi keshari sevanam bhakti uchati. Sarva upadi, all the unwanted imposition on the self. This idea of upadi, Shankaracharya is giving an example. If you have a glass of water in a crystal glass and you put a red flower behind it, the glass will appear red. But actually the glass is not red, it's not even touched by the flower or touched by the redness. It is only an illusion. So similarly, Brahman is pure and when it comes, it's touched by the guna, then it appears that it is covered by the guna. But it is not. You can give the example also of the sun being appearing to be covered by the clouds, but the sun is not covered by the clouds. It's covering our vision. So, um, Shankaracharya is a very important concept. This Upadi, sometimes he's using another word for the same meaning. Right from the beginning of his sutra explanation, right before the first sutra, he's saying that this book called Shariraka Sutra, because this is under the name of the Brivedanta Sutra, Shariraka, embodied self sutra, is to tell that you are the embodied Brahman in the body. <coughs> the book is telling you how you can get rid of the body and become Brahman again. Shariraka Bhashya. He writes this commentary on the Shariraka and he's giving this idea of superimposition that actually something was imposed on Brahman to change it. 
right from the beginning he says that when he was speaking, I told yesterday on the first sutra, Vyasadev is not giving the right definition of the second sutra. He's not giving the right definition of Brahman by saying Jamadiya Sedyataha because this is only the Tatashta Lakshana of Brahman, the external aspect of the definition. Brahman cannot be defined. Brahman is beyond description. But if you want a if you want a description, then in the same Upanishad that says uh Yato Vaibani Bhutani Jayante where this Janamadiya Sedyataha comes from or is linked in the same Upanishad called Tetariya Upanishad, then you have the Satyam, Gyanam, Anantam, Brahma. This is, he says, this is the Swarupa Lakshana definition of Brahma. But how could Shankar, how could Vedavyas make a mistake? How could he make a mistake right from the beginning? But this is Shankaracharya's claim, oh, there's two Brahma, higher Brahma, Parabrahma, and lower Brahma, Aparabrahma. Yes? No, I was counting. You were counting that you were saying the qualities of this Brahman, Satyam, Gyanam, and Anantam. Anantam. Anantam meaning endless. Yeah. But, you know, in later Vedanta you have Satchita Ananda. The Ananta became Ananda. It appears that, right, even at, in, during Shankara's time, this concept which he proposes should have been opposed violently all around. <laughs> But because it was mainly covered over by Buddhist think thinkers, then nobody dared do it. And like I said yesterday, Shankaracharya reunited all the different Brahmana, Smartha Brahmana, that were fighting with each other, saying this deity, Vishnu, is superior, now this deity uh, of Shiva is superior, now this deity of Ganesh. So I said, they all won. This is brilliant interpretation. They're all one. You know, it doesn't matter. You can worship this one, that one, that one. It's all one anyway. Ultimately, it's Parabrahma. This is Aparabrahma. So he reconciled all these different uh, views. Then he also reintroduced the importance of Veda, because Veda were discarded. How does Shankar come to the idea uh, if uh, Brahman can see, if Brahman can hear, if a man can move in water, if a man can walk, move in earth or in air, this means he has senses and he has, uh, I mean, this is a person who asked it, how did they come to the idea of Nirvishesh? Because he's, when one of it says that he moves and, and he walks and he sees, he's just going to say this, I was just words to make us understand that there is a seeing principle and a walking principle, but this is go way beyond our senses. This is how he explains. We'll, we'll go further. He speaks about Lakshana. Lakshana Vritti. Because this is... also uh, combine this with the deities that we worship, that when Brahman manifests, he's all manifest, but when he's manifest, he is Yes, Ishvara for Shankaracharya is the manifested Brahma, Saguna Brahma, lower Brahma. And then he may walk and he may see, yes. <coughs> but in the end he doesn't walk and see. In the end there's nothing there. Yeah. Okay. But why is Brahma manifesting if he is free of desire? How does desire to manifest? This Ishvara principle for Shankaracharya is to help the Jiva souls or to help the conditioned Brahman to become liberated. He has this um, prasad, this mercy, this uh, kindness. That's why Shankaracharya and his followers are saying that the Ishwara or the Apara Brahma or Saguna Brahma is Brahma covered with Sattva Gun. He doesn't have any Rajagun, he doesn't have any Tamas, but he's covered by Sattva Gun. His pure intention. He doesn't say Vishuddha Sattva, he says just Sattva Gun, but you have to transcend Nirguna, all the, all the Gunas. Yes? For, for, for how long Shankaracharya was a king? I mean, how many years after Ramanuja or Madhvacharya appeared? A long time after, because. Uh, 
solo. Yes. Yeah. Shankara Acharya was a very powerful preacher, and on account of his preaching, Buddhism left totally the continent, the subcontinent of India. They went to Sri Lanka, they went to uh, Cambodia, Japan, after Japan, but China, they went to many places. But India, now they start having again Buddhist, you know, because when the Dalai Lama had to flee from Tibet, so they accepted them because India is accepting everybody. But his uh, his Shankara Sharia is still king till today. He's still the reference for both Indian and Western thinkers. They consider all the Pandita, they all study Shankaracharya's philosophy. So in the academic world, Shankaracharya yeah. is accepted? Yes, because he's, he's, he's uh, not promoting any Ishwara. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the um, Western scholars, even Indian, whenever they speak about Vaishnavism, they, they yeah. say this uh, sectarian, they call it a sect. They don't set up for Shankara Sharya's followers, but everything which concerns Shiva worship or Vishnu worship, they call it a sect, meaning uh, they have like a preconceived idea. Jai Maharaj. Right. Vishnu Swami, Ramanujacharya, Madhuracharya, Nimadita, they are accepted in the academic world. Uh, Ramanuja Sharya um, is pretty much respected for some who knows Vedanta. That now many scholars don't know Vedanta, they don't study. But Ramanuja Sharya, uh, some of the commentators, modern commentators, have said that his commentary is much closer to uh, Vedavyas than Shankaracharya, this uh, Tibo. You know. That's his idea. You know. He said Ramanuja Sharya is closer. Um, Vishnu Swami uh, uh, Sutra Bhashya is not available anymore. It disappeared somehow, somehow. Maybe locked in some monastery. Because you know that Ramanuja Charya, he, he said right in the beginning, introduction, he says that actually there's been this Vishita Dvaita philosophy has been existing before me. So he, he says there's a Bodhayan. You know, Bodhaya and Swami that has written the Vritti, and he find a copy. He goes with a, his famous disciple Kuresh to Kashmir, and he somehow they memorize the whole book and stuff like this. And he's quoting other other thinkers. So it, it, this is an interesting aspect of Ramanuja Sharya. He's saying it took him 12 years to write his Sri Bhasha, but he's saying he's giving reference to previous Acharya who has written some uh, Bhashya on the Vedanta. Whereas Madhvacharya is claiming there is no spiritual master available today in this age of Kali, so he goes directly to see Vedavyas in the Himalaya and receive all the instruction from him. And Madhvacharya Sutra is quite difficult to understand, not because it is cryptical, but because he's giving totally different subject than the others and not quoting the same scriptures. But he wrote another commentary, smaller, Anuvakhyana, that actually says that all words in the Veda are glorification of Vishnu. Uh, that is the speciality of... And uh, Shri Gurudev, he says, while he was translating Vedanta Sutra, I don't know if he translated the whole thing, but the first part, it's been published in Hindi. He told me that he used five commentaries, three uh, from... Uh, Three from Madhvacharya and two from Baladev Vidyabhushana. And also, uh, of course, he got the help of. Uh, I always forget. Shridhar Swami's guru. Anyway, um, so this idea of Upadi, I haven't finished this, the bottom of this same paragraph. Um, this. Twenty-three is, it has nothing to do with your uh, copies. It's just uh, the, the written font, you know, like this. Yeah, twenty-three. This doctrine is saying it's the middle. This doctrine is saying that the expansion of the universe and the multiplicity, multiplicity of souls, which are essentially foreign to Brahman, are imposed 
on this Brahman by virtue of ignorance, avidya. It is through the phenomena of upadi or superimposition that Brahman received the characters either of the Supreme Lord, Ishvara, or the universe or the individual soul. In other words, it is through this upadi that you have Ishvara, that you have the world, that you have the souls. It's just a covering. Ishvara is just a more subtle covering, but it is a covering. Similarly, according to the frequently repeated image taken from Mandukya Karika, that was written by Godapada, his Paramaguru, universal space, Akash, appears as having dimension and a particular form when it has for Upadi or limiting adjunct, the part that contains a parcel of space. Can you explain this? Yeah, so it's, just like, it's just saying that you have a part, there's space inside. You break the, the part, then the space that was imprisoned in the part becomes one with the, you know, space. That's that's the idea. But uh, Prabhupada was saying, well, this is very, very good, but the only problem is that we are not part. <laughs> you know? And this limiting adjunct or upadi is there. The body is, lim is, is, is an upadi. And uh, our material conception, our upadi, that's why it says, sarvo upadi vinir muktam, we have to be free from all kind of upadi. But it doesn't mean that this upadi is totally illusory and whatever is inside will mix with everything else, that, like the air, the, the, the air that is within my part and the air that is within the part. If we break to two parts, then there's no more individual contained air. That is the idea of Godapada and Shankaracharya and all the followers. To mean that there's only one soul, the Brahman that is everything. You know, you know the refutation of all these things. I mean, if you don't, we can go over it afterwards. Uh, because Prabhupada in his books was always defeating all this type of theory, ridiculous theory actually. Um, it can give some idea of spirituality, but ultimately to deny all individuality is nonsense because it's, it's just not natural thing. You go from Sankhya, which says there's many pollution, but they don't connect with each other. How can they be happy? Just they are frozen in space and they don't connect with each other, but they have a multiplicity of souls. To the other side, where it says there's no individuality, just oneness, just one one being indefinable, whatever. But can you defeat this one example you just gave? Uh, the, the pots, uh, you can breaking yeah. pots, and because, because it seems logical and it seems very intelligent. So how to counteract such an idea? It, it is, we'll see, actually, no, I don't want to waste too much time because no, they, they, they are numbered. Vedanta Sutra have, as an example, for the illustration of Brahman, Akasha. It gives different symbols of Brahman. I don't know how to call them. I, I call them symbols. Akasha, Prana, which is life, air. Akasha means the sky. Then Prana means life, air. Then Jyoti means light. Then Aditya means the sun. It compares, but we can see it at that time. The Akasha is not Brahman itself. It's just an example. So this example that is given of a, of a part, if it is just an individuality and it discover a greatness outside, okay. But how can you compare the Jivatma to simple air, space? It is, it is insufficient. It is given, it is described in the second chapter that the Atma is conscious, it is the doer, it is Amsha, part of something greater, it is uh, consciousness, did I say that? Consciousness. Chit. Chit. So therefore, it, then how can you compare it to uh, Akash? <coughs> yes. So after the day of Brahma, and after the life of Brahma, then all the elements, all the... They merge into Brahma. And then they enter back into Brahma Vishnu. Ultimately, yes. After the life of Brahma. Yes. There is no consciousness or... It's dormant. Yeah. 
And that's a long period. It's a long period, but this is pretty much what the Buddhists want, you know, so to merge into big sleep, you know. This is like the, the limit of, of knowledge is Brahmananda. It doesn't go beyond that. According to Bhaktivinoda Kaur Jagadama, that's what he says, that, that you cannot go beyond Brahmananda, that some, or Brahman, that you can conceive and be attracted by yourself, by your reading, by your association to the Brahman conception, but you cannot go higher without a pure devotee. And some of the people, they will be just satisfied to sleep within Vishnu's body. Okay. That, is, that is for them their freedom, liberation, whatever. Finally, peace. Final piece, but then, then they will have to come back again. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just temporary peace. But sometimes you, you don't lose your individuality. No, no. You, if you merge into Brahman, you may lose your individuality. You may, yes. For a long time, you were like unconscious. How is Shankara philosophy describes it? The Brahman is indivisible. How does this uh, air get dropped in a pot? Yes, that's a good question. But that's his whole theory of Maya, which is indefinable, indescribable. It is neither sat or asat. Obviously, Ramanujasharya's philosophy has many flaws right from the beginning. That's that's the thing. You know, how can you say it? Brahman is one, then it is divisible, and so, so many, and then the question also arises, if I break apart, if Brahman is one, then everybody should be liberated. Why just, you know, if you say just one person become liberated, that means individuality again. Um, I don't know if you've mentioned already, but have you mentioned how Mottacharya, Ramanujacharya, how they uh, attacked all of these illogical arguments in my body. Well, come You've actually that. written books on it and all. Because yeah. that's a very interesting yeah. topic when you're studying. Of course. Yeah. We'll come to that. I just want to carry on because the interpretation of Ramanuja Sharya, especially of Madhva Sharya for this sutra is very interesting. It's the second page, page 24. Ramanuja has a completely different idea and he says that actually about this idea that Shankaracharya was saying about the pot and about the Brahman that can see and hear and move but cannot be seen or heard, he's quoting a different Upal Upanishad concerning the Paramatma, Antaryami, because that is his philosophy, Sharira Sharili. The earth is his body, he moves on the earth but the earth doesn't know him. The waters are his body, he moves on the water, but the water doesn't know him. The air in the body is his body, he moves in the air, but the air doesn't know him. Space is his body, he moves in space, but the space doesn't know him. The mind is his body, he moves in the mind, but the mind doesn't know him. He is the inner core of all beings, free from all evil, the divine being, the effulgent Narayan. Knowing this lead to release, this is the doctrine of the Veda. So then, you see totally different interpretation and different quotations because according to Ramanuja Acharya's philosophy, the souls in the world are just the body of the super soul. We are covering him. Not that we are covered by his maya, we are covered in him. Well, uh, come again with this philosophy again. It's interesting. It is not our philosophy, but it's interesting to know. But Madhvacharya, we claim to be in his line, and this is totally quite different interpretation, totally different translation. He doesn't see why Vedavyas will change the subject. Because we were on discussing, we have to know Brahman, who is Brahman, Brahman is from whom everything manifests. How do we know this? Because Shastra is the evidence. And how do we understand Shastra? We have to understand Shastra through Samanvaya, thorough examination and concordance and logical connection between different scriptures. And then you come uh, with this Brahman, with the help of this investigation, is not inexpressible, says uh, Madhvacharya. So this sutra, is either with a long A or a, small, or a short A. 
Ikshatir Nashabdam means it has been seen, or that which is seen, the Purusha, seeing nature, is seen. called seen. 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 Like seen. I-N-G, or seen, past tense. Past tense. It has been seen that it is against the Veda, not Shabda, na Shabda, small, uh, short A, na Shabda. This is the first translation. But Madhvacharya and Baladevita Bhushana, they are saying with a long A, they taking now the particle, negative particle na with the word a Shabda together. Uh, in other words, they don't read na, then further on Shabda, but they read na a Shabda. It has been seen and you have to provide whatever is missing in the text, that this Brahman is not Ashabda, meaning inexpressible. Because this is exactly what the Shankarita is saying. They're saying that Brahman is beyond words. You cannot describe it by words, you cannot conceive it by mind. Therefore, the Veda, they say, can only give you indirectly description, but not direct description. And this is called epistemology of language. So, interestingly, Madhvacharya is taking whatever is missing in this sutra as a Purva Paksha. The wrong Siddhanta is given by the Mayavad saying that Brahman is not expressible by words. You can read the Veda, but ultimately you cannot understand Brahman by words, which contradicts what Vedavyas is saying. Shastra is the evidence. Shastra Yonitva through Samanvaya is understandable. Marvacharya is saying it is certainly not inexpressible. So I go on the, almost the last paragraph of this, page 24. You can read again at home and do your homework. The, Prabhu, then Samanvaya means... Samanvaya means... The, the, divine, the divine connection. Yes, connection between... Like yeah. Madhvacharya was saying, the beginning and the end, whatever repeats itself in the text, what is <coughs> no apurva, what is the over-glorification artavada, what is the fruit phala, pala, what, what is the uh, logical connection. So this is called Samanvaya. Yeah, also in the Vedas it is said that you cannot describe the supreme yes. transcendental object matter with material language. We come to this because this is the Veda Shruti. They, they speak about this, but late, just later. I just want, because this is a point of understanding reality. For some people, a word like microphone describes the real thing. For some thinkers, microphone is just a word among so many other words to describe a reality which I cannot really describe. And words are just being used as a convention. This epistemology <coughs> is being fully accepted by Shankaracharya and the Buddhist also. In this paragraph, almost the last one, it says that there are two realities. One is called metaphysical, paramartika, and the other one is called conventional, vyabharika. Ultimate reality, absolute truth, is only Brahman, and is, it is inexpressible. This is what Shankaracharya is saying. So how do we know, how can we understand Shastra, what Shastra is saying? He's saying by indirect meaning, lakshana vritti. Lakshana vritti is an indirect meaning. An example is given. Next page. Um, okay, we go. We go first through the Shruti uh, prayers because. Something was mentioned about it this morning. Someone mentioned, you mentioned, the Veda Stutina. You spoke about Veda Stutina. Yes. So how, how you can say it is inexpressible if the act, if Shankaracharya anyway accepts the Upanishad? Yes. 
So in Upanishad, something is said. It so says, how can you say, how can say it is inexpressible? It, it says indirectly. Huh? Shankaracharya will say it speaks indirectly. Just like if you want to see the Arundhati star, you look at the big star next to it. You cannot see it directly. So similarly, Shankaracharya is saying the words are describing things using metaphors, but ultimate reality cannot be understood by words or by mind. Upanishad is needed, but just the same thing about the worshipping of the Murti. You're worshipping the Murti because it helps you, because you cannot meditate on nothingness. But once you realize the oneness of everything, you don't need the Murti anymore. So you throw it in the sea. Par the Paramartic is not related to the ultimate reality, those two levels. The Paramartic uh, is not after resisting. There's two reality. Yeah. There's an ultimate reality, Paramartika, which is indescribable. That is Shankaracharya. Good they've used those words also. They are coming from Vedanta, all this uh, Swarupa Lakshana, Tatashta Lakshana, Paramartika, and, and, and uh, Vyavartika. He's also using those words. They call Vedanta terminology. But according to Shankaracharya and the Buddhist also, because the Himalayan Buddhists, they say the same thing. The ultimate reality is nothingness or not describable. It's beyond our words, beyond our intelligence, beyond our uh, understanding and, and whatever conception we can have. But we can make so many different, you know, Himalayan Buddhists, they have so many monstrous deities, you know, to this is projection of your mind. Ultimately, it just doesn't exist. It just helps to meditate. And at the same time, everything is nothingness. So, similarly, Shankara is saying everything is oneness. The difference between Shankaracharya and the Himalayan Buddhist is that one is saying everything is zero, and the other one is saying everything is one. But basically, it's the same principle. And so they're using this thing of, okay, Vedas Tuti, because the question was asked. In a third, in a second paragraph, and you have this question of 25. You have this question in the Bhagavatam. O Brahmana, Brahman is beyond quality, Nirguna, this cannot possibly be indicated by words. Anir Deshi. So how can Shruti, which consists of words having worldly quality, Guna Vrita, describes it directly? To this Shukadev Goswami reply, the Lord manifested the intelligence, mind, senses, and vital breath of the living entity so that they could indulge in sensitive objects, take repeated birth in this world, become elevated in future lives, and ultimately attain liberation. In other words, he's explaining, he's answering. The Supreme Lord gave you everything so that you can attain whatever you desire, including liberation, including going back home, back to God. But if you want to have pleasure, enjoyment, you can also do this because it gives you everything. The senses, the thought, the feelings, everything is real. They are created by the divine law and likewise the enslavement of the jiva is also real. So the Vedas can actually describe Vishnu's form, Vishnu's pastime, Krishna walking in Vrindavan, Krishna growing, his feet growing, because I will listen this morning. You know. The earth takes more pleasure because the feet of Krishna are growing. So the impression of his feet goes deeper into the earth and she feels thrilled by the touch of Krishna. This is real description of Parabrahma. It is not an imagination. And yes, they cannot describe fully. That's for sure, because it's beyond mind, beyond intelligence, it cannot describe fully. That is why when devotees, they're discussing about the spiritual world, how it is there, then we are talking about something, there's no way we can, we can understand, there's no way. Because this is a hint, we are giving a, a, a picture, a mental picture. But we cannot, it's always beyond our imagination. Yes. So it, it may be not the, the worst of the example given by Shankar Shaya because it may be true in some way. But like we say, we cannot describe what is prem, 
what is higher bhav. If someone is not in this consciousness, he cannot really understand this mood. So he may be not so wrong in what he said that you cannot understand Brahman. Yes. My Bhacharyas, Paradevita Bhushana, all the Acharya, Vaishnava Acharya, they agree with this. They say Brahman cannot be fully expressed. Mm. When it says it's inexpressible, it means it cannot be expressed in full. But it can still give an idea. With Bhakti Nottakova in the Bhagavad, he says that the world is a dictionary of the spiritual world. And whatever we are using to our little capacity is giving sufficient knowledge for us to have an attraction for it, an understanding that can clear, all, clear also all of doubts. If the Guru cannot clear your doubt by words, how can he do it? Just by touching you on the head, that can work for some people, but ultimately he is conveying his words, his teaching, and you follow, and something is working, even for Shankaracharya. They are not st stupid. To us, they may look stupid, how can, or you may think, yes, he's, he's right, but his truth is between the two. It's, it's like they, they, they know that they cannot give their teaching simply by being silent. I, I read once a book uh, on the appearance of a great uh, Chandra Kirti, a great uh, Buddhist master, and he sat for one hour and didn't say a word. Everybody was asking questions, he didn't say a word. Then the conclusion was great. Was the uh, great was the speech of Chandra Kirti? He didn't say a word. And so that's the idea of Buddhists. They don't say anything and they feel satisfied. But ordinarily, people are feel very frustrated with this kind of approach. So the problem is to say that better a fool remain silent than open his mouth and confirm it. <laughs> That's the way of putting it. <laughs> yes? This commentary or the explanations of Sankaracharya, they can become very fascinating and they give us some, uh, you call it? some fascination. Yeah, you may become attracted to become a Mayavad. So therefore it is not recommended. Chaitanya Mahabhuta Bhattacharya, Sattva Bhattacharya, if one reads Sarirak Bhasha, his whole bhakti is, is void. But Jiva Goswami had to study it. Yes, on the order of Nityananda Prabhu. Mm -hmm. And I asked Guru Dev's permission. I asked him, I said, can we read Sarirak Bhasha of Shankar? He said, yes, but you have <coughs> to do it just for preaching. And you should read also Bharata Vidya, uh, Vidya Bhushana's Govinda Bhasha. The idea is that if you don't know what Shankaracharya is saying, how can you see that he is contradicting himself? And he contradicts himself all the time. He's not a fool, but he has a special agenda. Anyway, this uh, third paragraph and then page 25, 25, it speaks about the uh, epistemology of language. The literal meaning of the word, mukya vritti, is produced when the word refers clearly to a particular object. An example of a second, like, you know, this is a table, okay? If you speak English, then you understand the word table. Uh, if you speak a different language, it's not comprehensible to you. But you can make it understandable by sign language or by pointing out the table, and then the direct meaning is clear. If I say, I don't know, the sky is blue, of course the sky is not blue, but everybody is perceiving it as such, so at least, or for, for one who can see colors also, then it's also the plain meaning. The, an example of the secondary meaning, or gonavriti, is the word lion. In the sentence, Devadatta is a lion. In that sentence, lion means that Devadatta is endowed with bravery like a lion, it's very strong. In a sentence, there is a village on the Ganga, the phrase on the Ganga is figurative, Lakshana. Since the village cannot be on the Ganga, it's close to the Ganga. The meaning is that the village is situated on the bank of the Ganga. So how can the Shruti use this function of words, literal, secondary, and figurative for Brahman, which in reality cannot be an object of direct or secondary or figurative reference because Manvacharya is saying, but if you're using Lakshana, 
you still using words. If you say that this indirect meaning, it is still words. Those indirect meaning ultimately point to nothingness. So therefore, you will have to explain by another indirect meaning and so on and so forth. But Srila Jiva Goswami in his Sarva Sambadini, you know Sarva Sambadini, he wrote the Shat Sandarbha, then he wrote an explanation. This is how Goswami work, you know, the Acharya, they write their own commentaries. Like Sanatana Goswami write his own commentary to Briyad and Bhagavatam Rita. So Jiva Goswami <coughs> wrote his sub-commentary to the Shat Sandarbha called Sarva Sambadini, to the first four Sandarbha, describing Sambandha. So he's saying, this is the fourth uh, paragraph, if Brahman is indescribable, even using the word indescribable makes subject to description. It is claimed that it is an indirect expression, Lakshana. It is still described, but indirectly. Like saying that Ganga can be described through indirect expression, Brahman, when described as indescribable, is in fact described. It will be truly indescribable if it could not be called describable or indescribable. Then it will necessarily be completely false. Because if something that cannot be described uh, or cannot be called indescribable is totally false. If one argues that the world indescribable is Lakshana only, one still ends up with Brahman being described. One arrives at the toll gate in the morning, so to speak, in spite of attempting to escape the toll. You know, you just wanted to escape the toll, you walk all night long and you came back to the same gate. So basically, and it's going on like this, you will read it on your own, to explain how Brahman actually can be described by words. That is a very interesting point by Madhvacharya. This Tattu Samanvaya Ikshater Nashabdam is the key to understand the whole Vedanta Sutra according to Madhva. That, no, it is not true. Brahman can be described. Brahman can be understood. Of course, you need a guru to understand. It's like, those who have been brought in the institution after so many years, we thought we knew uh, Shaitana Shalitam retired by heart. Then Gurudev came and he started saying, right from the beginning, you know, what was the real object of the Shaitana Shalitam retired? We never seen it before. He opened, the, he had the key, he said often, you had the chest box and he, I have the key. You know there's something valuable in it, but you never were capable of opening it. And right from the beginning, this famous verse of describing Chaitanya's descent, we read it many times without understanding anything. And Gurudev, he explained the whole thing. So the Veda sometimes may seem cryptic, but it is possible to understand them, and it's possible also to understand Vedanta Sutra. I know there's many technical terms, but so far the, fifth sutra, the first five sutras, do you understand them? Who doesn't understand it? There's no shame. You were not there, so you don't know. No, but I, <laughs> I asked, uh, 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 Dronacharya asked, not Dronacharya, do you know? Yeah, Dronacharya. He asked, uh, after you've been a lesson, have you understood? And do you don't said, yes, I've understood. And everybody said, yes, but Yudhishthir said, no, I've not understood. And they said, what? What do you mean you've not understood? Because I've not realized. Yes. Because what? I've not realized. No, I haven't realized. It. I can repeat it, but I've not realized it. But my question was not on a metaphysical level, which is on a, um, you know, I'm trying to see if people were following. Yeah. So, you don't understand anything? Yeah. I understood like a few bits and pieces here, something. Like not that. everything. Not everything. Yeah. Because it's very technical? Okay. And you? Yes, yeah, same. same thing. Yeah, it is not a beginner's class. It's, it's required some background because um, it is a condense of all the different um, Upanishads and teaching. But it's very interesting just to hear and to um, eventually read it, some part of it, because. Um, our Acharya, I know Shiva Bhakti Pragyan Keshava Goswami, he also very much like this, um, this 
speaking on Vedanta, speaking on defeating, all the, you know, I, I translated it into French, it's uh, beyond Nirvana, it's great. Mm -hmm. I had to take away a little bit some of the boldness of Bhakti Pragyam Keshava because we don't have the same public anymore. But uh, he was speaking and preaching in the same mood as Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada, like I said, he earned his title, Bhakti Vedanta, before even becoming sannyas. So this, this, this Bhakti Vedanta has a meaning, a specific meaning. I know Srila Prabhupada will be pleased with a sincere attempt to understand those sutra. Not becoming impersonalist is always a danger. If you only read Tattva Siddhanta, then you may become Mayavadi. If you only read Rasa Tattva, you may become Sahaja. The problem is that you have to have enough Siddhanta to digest Rasa. This is important. Bhagavad Gita itself is Vedanta. Like I said, there's three uh, foundations of Vedanta. Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, Brahma Sutra. This is called Vedanta. Why is Bhagavad Gita called uh, Vedanta? Because it is the cream of all Upanishads. Uh, it is also making a, a, a brilliant synth synthesis. Anybody has read any Upanishad besides Isha Upanishad? Yes, which one? All of them? Men of the main ones, Shandogya Upanishad, Vyadavanda. They're quite difficult to understand and they, rep they, they repeat. They repeat. And Upanishads are described as Vedanta because they come at the end of Veda. After Veda, Brahmana, Aranyaka, then comes Upanishads. So Bhagavad Gita by itself is called Vedanta. But you can extend the definition right, to, to me. Huh? Gita Upanishad. Gita Upanishad. Jevadama I consider also Vedanta. It's like a combination of all the Goswami's writings. Shatsandarbha is also Vedanta. Uh, Jiva Goswami studied Bhagavatam according to Sambandha, Vidya, Prayojana, and he studied also Vedanta in Baranasi. So I consider also Vedanta. Yes. So it is maybe more easy to interpret the sutra because they are very short sentences. Yeah. But how how Shankaracharya managed to translate, to give the Bhagavad Gita and command the Gita? Well, the Gita is so clear at some point. So how he managed to escape the original meaning of Paramatma? Same thing. Huh? It's always the same thing. He's always saying these two realities. It's as once you understood what how Shankaracharya is thinking, then it becomes easier. Of course, he's using a philosophical language, which is abstruse, but but it's always coming down to the same thing. It's two level of reality. But he's saying uh, Narayano paro vyakta in the introduction of Bhagavad Gita. Narayan is above the avyakta, the unmanifested, and he he's being described as Govinda Shloka, which. But the Govinda wish Shankara Charis follow the night that he wrote that. Yes. He has uh, said Vyasadeva is mistaken. In the Bhagavad Gita, does he say Krishna is mistaken as well? No. He never said Vyasadeva is mistaken. <coughs> he's, he's following his thought, saying that Vyasadeva is describing just Apara Brahma, the uh, Saguna Brahma, but there's a higher reality. Meaning that Vyasadeva knows that. That's what he means. If, if you if you say everything is indirect meaning, you can say whatever you want. He says, well, he meant that, but indirectly he meant this. You see, like he's this called world jewelry, but he's he's a gentleman. He's not uh, saying right out that Vedavyas made mistake or Krishna is speaking nonsense. He's just giving his interpretation so that it appears that whatever knowledge you're receiving is still not the highest knowledge, it's something beyond. Um, number, number five, Bhagavad Gita, yes. Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, not yes, because when you express, when, yeah, expressible. When you express something, 
when something is expressible, meaning that it, it, you can describe. But when, you, when it is inexpressible, it means that it is beyond words. So uh, Madhva Sharya is saying it is not ashabda. Shabda means word. Ashabda means not word or not wordly. I don't know what word, word not. The, the, the. You can use the word Shabda to say it is an expression. And you can use the word Ashabda meaning no, it is not inexpressible. Shabda means sound. Yes. Shabda means many things, but he's taking it as a word. Shabda also means a word. By sound you cannot know. Yes. By sound you cannot know, and he's saying no, it is not true. By putting a long A, you see, there's a difference between... Um, in Sanskrit, when you have a long A or long E, it can change the meaning of a word. So what, which letter is in the original Brahma Sutra? Ah, ah, ah. That's it's, basically it's a like short the short A. Question. It's short short. A. But yes, but so Madhva interprets actually by making it long. Some some commentators introduce also sutras that are not in the so-called original. Our our conception of originality is really come from the West because this our oral trans you know. Trans the, the transmission, it's not given, it's not in a written form. It's been spoken first. So he's saying that you, know, you have to provide a long A because they made a mistake. That's well, even, even speaking. Well, he heard it from Vyas. So he should he come. heard it from Vyas so that you can <laughs> say this is the authority. He heard it from Vyas. But anyway, to. Uh, Give a commentary to Vedanta Sutra, you're allowed to introduce some words because words are missing anyway. They are missing. You cannot you cannot have the full definition of Brahma if you don't supply Brahman is. You don't know otherwise what he's speaking about. Well adding is one thing, but changing one letter that is clearly written this is quite Yes, for for you know, if we publish a book by someone else and we change anything, he can sue us because we've changed it. But this is a different transmission. It's <laughs> not automatic transmission. What he's saying he's questioning Madhva is questioning the authenticity of the short A version. One could see it like because that. there are many there could be many versions because originally it was it simply first. spoken. Yes. And then people wrote them down. Yes. And that's, so he's that's saying that you've written it down yes. incorrectly. You, you it's can. actually yes. long you, you, you can question the the uh, script, the whatever wrote the, the sutra. You don't that's question right. the authority. Mm -hmm. Because he, if he has asked Vyasadev, you know, what does it mean? And he answered, yes, this is what it means. Then he just repeats. But, you know, I, I don't... I don't take it blindly, like, okay, this is my watch, I'm saying this, this is what we follow. It's well, just he wrote it after being with Vyasadev, personally. Huh? He wrote it after being with Vyasadev, yes. personally, yes. so that's the authority. That's the authority, mm -hmm. and also we have to reconcile, how is it helping our understanding? Mm -hmm. What is interesting is say that all the other author are speaking about Samkhya. They are refuting Sankhya, starting from Sutra 5 all the way to Sutra 11, 6. That is called Adhikarana, one subject. And he's saying, why do you change the subject? The refutation of Sankhya is given in the fourth part of the first chapter. There is no need to refute it now. You have to stay on the same subject. We are speaking about Shastra. We are speaking about how you understand Shastra. You are, you are speaking, then the free verse is still speaking about the same subject. That is what is interesting. That Manvachar is making the whole, entire first part of the first chapter only one subject. That is more interesting than just having, because whatever other people are saying is also could be interesting. The famous space in the part and the Sharira Shariri. But how is it bringing something that will help us to understand better what is being said. Like, you cannot understand Brahman simply by speculation, by deduction. You cannot understand by pratyaksha, by seeing, by experiencing, only through Shastra. How do you understand Shastra? Not only by reading, but by studying it, by 
try to compare with the different parts of the text, see the concordance, how it is, is, is called intertext. You know, like you can see that some stories are repeated in different books. Why are they written differently? You can say, yeah, different compound. This is an explanation, but it's also a logical explanation. Some books are more philosophical and other books are more uh, storytelling. The interesting aspect of Bhagavatam is that it is both. The first three canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, all the Vedanta Sutra explanation is already there. Then you put the 11th canto and you have all the philosophy of the Bhagavatam, basically. But it says pre pretty much the same thing. Sometimes with the same wordings of the Upanishads, I, I uh, collected so many different similarity between the Upanishads and Bhagavatam, sometimes same wordings, and Bhagavad Gita, and Mahabharata, and other Puranas, and Manu Samhita, and Rig Veda. At least the Purusha Sukta is there, practically completely in the second canto, and so many other, other uh, Samkhya, Yoga, so many, because it's called Shruti Saram. The Bhagavatam is the compilation, and this gives the interpretation the right interpretation of Vedanta Sutra, a com commentary if you want, then it also expand the meaning of Gayatri Mantra, then they also explain the meaning of Mahabharat. For example, it's interesting to see that the word Parikshit in the Mahabharat is not spelled the same way. It's a small, it's a small I. And in the Bhagavatam, it's Parikshit, it changed the meaning. Parikshit means to observe. And the story is not the same. In the Mahabharata, Parikshit is afraid of dying, and he tried to hide, put himself in a big uh, citadel where he tried to protect himself, and then somehow the snake bird managed to come and kill him. But it's completely different in the Bhagavatam. How come? Because Mahabharata is, has a different purpose than Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam gives you the cream of Mahabharata, the cream of all the Upanishads, all the Veda and Vedanta. Yes. Uh, could the scriptures be uh, interpolated? For example, I heard uh, Padma Purana is translated yes. by my bodies. Uh, the word Sampradaya beginning it doesn't exist. It doesn't there in the could it be uh, different versions of uh, Vedanta Sutra? No. No, this is accepted by everyone. That it is uh, just like Srimad Bhagavatam. Sometimes you see that uh, it seems like it begins the first canto and ends at the second canto, and then we begin another story of Maitreyarishi. It seems like it's a different, you know, like we're coming back to the same stories of creation, sub creation. And but most scholars agree that Srimad Bhagavatam is written by one person or by a series of persons or whatever, but it's uh, like a complete work. And, and Brahma Sutta, there are different versions, sometimes there are more sutras, sometimes less sutra, and the interpretation of course is like this, but it's a complete uh, set. Uh, Puranas, it's written in uh, Bhagavad Purana it, it, it itself. Uh, Amala Purana is Srimad Bhagavatam. Other Puranas have defects. And modern scholars are saying that Padma Puranas and Skanda Puranas and many Puranas, they've been uh, collected works, sometimes later works. Bhavishya Purana also speak about the British in India in Victorian uh, days. So it's difficult for many people to accept. Uh, Parma Purana, this verse, yes, they say that it doesn't exist in the current edition of Parma Purana. But again, the Amnaya verse, Amnaya Sutra of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying that we don't have to study all those Puranas. You can take your entire life to study all the Puranas. Amnaya means to accept whatever the Guru Parampara selected as Shastra. So they selected those verses, whether they were the original Purana or they came later or they were added. It doesn't matter so much. Yes? 
No, just um, like the way that you're mentioning, for example, you just mentioned the Padma Parada, that some people don't accept it because it talks about the British being... That's Bhavishya, yeah. Bhavishya Parada. Yes. Or Bhavishya, I thought yeah. you said. Padma Purana, he brought this up, that some people think that this Sampradaya Vinihaye verse uh -huh. describing the false <coughs> Sampradaya is not in the original Padma Purana. It was added later on. Yeah. Well, one question arises because just like in uh, like Hans Maharaj's class, he's you know explaining the lecture of the Bhagavad Gita. So, you know, Bhakti Vinod is fully aware of the influence of these British scholars and how they misinterpreted the time frames. And, you know, so there seems like there could definitely be some possibility that uh, intentionally they've added certain things just to cast doubts. That's just my question. It doesn't change anything because Bhavisha Purana is not like a complete authority for us. It's not being quoted extensively by the Acharya, especially this part or the Jesus, Jesus that meet the king, you know, he says my name. Isha Putram Shaman Vidi Komaram Garba Sambhavam. My name is Son of God. I was born from a virgin. I am preaching Mecha Dharma. This is the Bhavishya Purana. But really who is quoting this verse among our Acharya? Yeah, yeah. There is an article. It's suspect. Uh, yeah, the Bhavishya yes. Purana is really suspect. Yes. Because there was a nice analysis that I read about two weeks ago, actually, about it. And it pulls all these verses out that are completely inconsistent with Vedic tradition, yeah. which looked like they were just inserted. Yes. Um, That's the meaning that they, they can sometimes, in some Purana, some things can be inserted. But also because Indian don't respect chronology, they don't, like, they can, anytime they can put put again some new version, and especially in Purana, not in Bhagavad Gita, not, but the Delta Sutra is pretty reliable. S someone asked me the, if they, what is a Sanskrit copy that is authorized, I don't know, but you know, there are some authorized copy, yeah. People will learn it by heart, it's easy to memorize, it's really not difficult. It's just short sentence, you know. Atato Brahma Jigyasya, Jirmadiya Siddhata, Shastra Yonidva, Tato Samambaya Ikshatara Nashabda, five sutra. Then it goes on, Gonashya Nakma Shabda, Tanishtaya, Tanishtaya, Moksha Padesha, and so on and so forth until Ananda Maya Ubiyasa. Okay, well, only one sutra, but. Yeah, but you linked it to the other ones. Huh? You built the progression back again. <laughs> I want this to be complete. Yeah. You know, I put the translation for you. And you have translation for the next two. And I just wanted to give an idea how the commentators can interpret completely differently and translate it differently. Even though they know Sanskrit, they translate it differently because they're related to a different subject. And just by changing one single letter, reading it differently. Actually, it's not changing. We were saying changing. It's just reading it differently. It's not about changing. It's just reading it differently. Because to us, if we don't, you know, once I was speaking to a Sanskrit professor and I was quoting a verse on Maya, I said, what? Well, he didn't understand. So I said, oh, Maya. Because you have to put the long A. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Maya means mine. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, yes. It comes from the, you know, the, the personal pronoun, the first pronoun, mama, maya. So this uh, pronunciation is very important. But, uh, you said this, like, shabte, na, shabte. So shabte, na, a, shabte. Yes. So it's a long A. Yes. But you said it was originally short A. So that's I, I original, you know. I'm just saying that for the other commentator, they read it like this. They read na shabda, na small a, further shabda, and manvachara baladev na a shabda. So it changed the meaning. But the explanation they give is more interesting because you stay on the same subject and you say. Because they speak against my Bible philosophy. They say, no, you're saying that you cannot know Brahman by words, by the Veda, but we say, no, it's not true. You can know. You can read all the Krishna stories in the Bhagavad Purana. Yes? 
Yes. Can you can you convince That's the last question? Oh, okay, I cannot convince. <laughs> can, uh, can you convince or convert someone by explaining the Vedanta Sutra? Average people, no, no. No, it's better to use Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> <laughs> no average person knows Vedanta Sutra. Yes. They, because we're talking about the, you know, like this, this is bringing up the rules of debates. Before any debates, in ancient time, especially in Shankaracharya's time, debate was very important because you had to convert yourself to become the disciple of someone else. So he converted also big, big uh, scholars. You have to settle on what, what is the, 